Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to continue our discussion of World War I by laying out the situation on the Eastern Front in the early phases of the war, and talk about how the war, for the most part on the Western Front, ground to a halt and became a battle of attrition as opposed to a battle, an attempt to militarily defeat your opponent. So here's your objectives. Let's lay out the situation on the Eastern Front and continue forward with the Great War. As you hopefully remember from previous classes, uh, the Tsar Nicholas II was not the most popular ruler with certain segments of his people. Uh, the whole revolution of 1905, Bloody Sunday, the Days of Freedom, and the crackdown in the aftermath had made reformers relatively unhappy with him. At the same time, he also had this weird relationship with this uh, spiritual faith healer called Rasputin, who was able to help his son Alexei with his hemophilia. And so, the rise and uh, sort of influence that Rasputin had over Nicholas was causing problems with the upper crust of Russian society, even as the bourgeoisie and the lower classes were somewhat unhappy with his lack of reforms and change. Russia also faced some pretty substantial geographic challenges in World War I. Russia is a massive country. Their railroads were uh, underdeveloped at this point. They had vast resources, but actually mobilizing them were problematic. And the vast majority of Russians were still tied to the land through their system of debt peonage. And so their calling up soldiers and outfitting them was always going to be difficult for Russia. And moving them to the front is going to be difficult. And so all of, for all of these reasons, Russia started mobilizing first and really kicked off the ticking clock that led to the beginning of World War I. And Russia was always going to have a lot of trouble uh, with this whole mobilization thing. In the early phases of the war, in order to cut Russia off from the rest of the world, Germany is going to execute a, a pretty effective submarine blockade. These submarines or undersea boats are going to stop all ships coming to Russia and are going to effectively cut Russia off from the rest of the allies, meaning that Russia is going to have to manufacture more or less all of the things that they're going to need. And that's going to be a huge problem for the underdeveloped and underinfrastructured Russian empire. German control over the Mediterranean, and especially once the Ottomans get into the war and the control of the Dardanelles and Bosporus, coupled with German submarine activity in the North Atlantic, are going to make it, again, almost impossible for the Russians to get effectively resupplied. All of this are going to lead to spectacular economic problems. The reforms of uh, guys like Stolypin had not completely industrialized the Russian empire. And so because of this, Russia is going to face supply challenges, going to, not going to be able to produce enough weapons, uh, is going to struggle with manpower and transportation and all of these things. Russian soldiers are going to struggle to get enough guns and bullets and things like that to simply fight this war. Despite all of that, because the Schlieffen plan required Germany to attack through Belgium and to focus on their sort of Western front first, in the early phases of the war, the Russians are going to face very little resistance for the Germans, pushing in to sort of these areas of the traditional Russian homeland and pushing in to threaten potentially, you know, some of the Kaiser's traditional lands and some of these early areas. And so huge Russian armies are going to pour into eastern Germany and the Russians are going to feel like they're accomplishing a lot in these early phases. Here you can see the... Uh, here you can see some of the downsides of the Russian military. And so we'll take a moment to pause and read some of this. Obviously, the Russian roads not being developed is really problematic. And uh, having Russian, Russian troops ill-armed, ill-supplied are really difficult. And so the Russians, again, face some massive barriers to success in the early phases. But again, lack of German resistance is going to lead to Russians taking some pretty significant territory. The Germans are then going to move two generals over to the Eastern Front, especially after the Schlieffen Plan fails. This is Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff. Hindenburg being sort of the older general and Ludendorff being the younger and more sort of vigorous, creative guy. These two guys are going to take over the Eastern Front and with limited resources are going to execute some pretty spectacular military uh, victories here. Most famously, the Battle of Tannenberg. So, in the Battle of Tannenberg, the Germans are able to use a much smaller force to defeat two massive Russian armies by using railroads to move troops along. Small blocking forces are used to slow down Russian troops. And then railroads through East Prussia allow the Germans to first 
are surround and destroy one massive Russian army, and then surround and destroy a second massive Russian army when it comes to assist the first one. And so the destruction of these two armies leads to the, the Germans capturing an almost unthinkable number of prisoners of war and leads the Russians army to approach collapse in the early phases of 1914 with two huge armies now taken off the board. Again, the, the amazing Russian general Brusilov is going to be able to hold Russian forces together and get them back on the line, retreat to find a defensible position. And the Russians, imposing brutal discipline on their troops, are going to be able to establish a kind of stalemate on the Eastern Front, although never as sort of static as we see on the West. And so the Russians are going to have massive problems, but they're going to hold their own for a little while against the Germans. And the Germans are going to, again, turn their focus back to other fronts. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was supposed to be an equal fighting force, or at least somewhat of an equal fighting force to the Germans, and it was hoped that they would be able to easily crush Serbia and then throw their weight along with the Germans against Russia, Britain, and France. This sort of Germanic alliance of these two great powers was theoretically supposed to relieve pressure on the Germans. But in the early phases of the war, the Serbians are actually going to defeat the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In a series of battles, the Serbians are going to drive the Austro-Hungarians back, leading to um, a military analyst to quip that Prussia, or Germany in this case, is, quote, shackled to a corpse, and that instead of providing getting aid from Austria-Hungary, the uh, Austria-Hungary is going to be constantly asking Germany for more troops, more supplies, which Germany is going to really struggle to provide, considering they're single-handedly fighting a massive two-front war against great powers. And so Austria-Hungary is going to be a huge humiliation. In the end, most of their fighting is going to happen between Austria-Hungary and Italy. They're going to fight 16 different battles of the Isonzo River, which is sort of the, one of the rivers in between Italy and Austria-Hungary. And the fact that they fight 15 different battles there tells you how indecisive these battles were. In the end, they're really unpleasant trench warfare, massive casualties, and nothing much is accomplished except killing huge numbers of soldiers on both sides. So Austria-Hungary is going to hold off Italy, which joins the Allied powers, breaking the Triple Alliance, and they are going to be able to defeat Romania, but Serbia is going to hold them off, and they're not going to be a source of aid for Germany, honestly, more of a liability. We're going to see the first use of poison gas at the Battle of Ypres. Neither side could break through the trenches after the Battle of the Aisne, and so both sides are going to complete what's called the Race to the Sea, where they quickly attempt to find a flank and turn it. And the two armies meet at Ypres in what is today Belgium, and we get the first use of poison gas. We'll let you read about what it was like to, uh, to experience poison gas. Uh, it's pretty horrific, so again, warning about that, but here's a poison gas attack. Take a moment, read, and we'll move on. And the German first poison gas attack was so effective, so much more effective than they thought, that they didn't even bother, bother to follow it up. They had just been sort of testing it out to see how it would work. And in the end, it utterly devastated the French troops in front of them. And they weren't even ready to attack and counter, and counter and take territory from it. Over time, both sides developed more effective countermeasures to the gas, but then they also developed ways to get around these countermeasures. You get gas masks, but then you get gas that destroys gas masks. A combination of different types of poison gases became more effective. And in general, all of this was incredibly unpleasant and traumatic, and dying of gas was reportedly... was. Uh, horrific to experience as, as as horrific to experience as it was to watch. So here's the uh, accounts of French troops. Again, spectacularly horrific. The Germans are going to send in massive reinforcements to the Battle of Ypres in what's known as the Kindermord. They're going to recruit uh, not exclusively school children, but they are going to recruit a bunch of high school age kids into the army, give them the rudiments of training, and then send them in. These high schoolers are going to be, for the most part, mowed down by British and French machine guns in what's called, again, the death of the children. You see here a, a, a monument to the death of the children at the Battle of Ypres. And what this taught both sides is that it's, it's a manpower issue, but again, you're mostly feeding these troops into an industrial meat grinder that's grinding them up and destroying them. 
very little was accomplished from the battle of the from the the death of these children. And uh, as ger- many Germans said, it was simply uh, you know simply destroying the next generation of Germans in order to accomplish nothing. The British are going to use pretty harsh propaganda in order to recruit people for Kitchener's army. The uh, Lord Kitchener here is the war secretary. We have this famous poster, which you're probably familiar with because it was adopted for a United States propaganda poster later. But they would recruit people by finding attractive women who would go around and induct people into the order of the white feather. So here's an account of what it was like for young men wandering around in England, not fighting to be harassed by women and called cowards. So pause. This led to the recruiting of all of these people. And so we created, Lord Kitchener created this massive army that he's then going to spend several years training and prepare to unleash on the Germans at the Battle of the Somme. The Battle of the Somme was an incredibly bloody attempt to break through the German lines. In the end, if you're interested, there's tons of documentaries and uh, movies to watch about this. But on the first day of the battle, 20,000 British soldiers died. The Somme in its entirety took somewhere in the area of you know eight months to fight with repeated attempts to break through no, no man's land. And in the end, the casualties were probably over a million soldiers dead in this one battle, quote unquote. Although again, it's it's hard to call the Psalm a battle, right? It's a it's an eight month long struggle over this one period, this one piece of land that's going to be utterly devastated. Uh, the pre-war artillery, the pre-battle artillery bombardment was eight days firing millions of shells. And then even after that, you're basically just feeding troops into this battle with the goal being, by the end, not even really breaking through, but again, killing so many troops that the enemy cannot fight any longer. This strategy was known as attrition. Both sides became to understand, uh, came to understand that actual military victory might be impossible, and instead you needed to exhaust your opponent's will to fight. You needed to create situations that were so traumatic and resource-intensive that there was just simply no way to continue the battle. And so they built more complex trenches. They built secondary trenches. They built you know, machine gun pillboxes. They had massive artillery bombardments using different types of shells. You know, They re-fortified no man's land with barbed wire, all of these things. The Battle of Verdun was a German attempt to exhaust the French to take the fortress at Verdun. And it happened and unfolded basically the same way as the Somme. Both sides set up railroads to bring in troops and supplies to this massive battle. And then in the end, millions of soldiers were injured and almost no territory was gained on either side. Again, it was mostly an attempt to exhaust the ability to fight. And so propaganda became increasingly important. Rationing of bread and other resources became important. Germany suffered through the turnip winter where there was nothing to eat but turnips for much of the German population. And so you get increasing propaganda to recruit people to go fight in this increasingly unpleasant war and also to demonize the enemy to justify why we're sacrificing all of this in order to mobilize. This also led to the creation of massive bureaucracies and increased governmental power on all sides as you needed massive coordination to fight this war. And we, see, we also saw an uprising of Irish people during this time where Irish people rose up against the British government and then were in an attempt to get independence and were spectacularly crushed by troops loyal to Great Britain. And so this was a first attempt to, or not a first attempt, but this was another attempt to get Irish independence. And it revealed some of the fault lines within these societies with the sense that other groups were not necessarily willing to sacrifice what was necessary in order to win World War I, especially when World War I seemed increasingly unwinnable. Both sides are going to, to some degree, engage in strategic bombing. The British are going to blockade the Germans and prevent any consumer goods from getting in. The Germans are going to sink all ships going to England. They're also going to build a massive gun called the Paris gun to lob shells into Paris. It wasn't particularly effective to do this, but they were, it wasn't particularly effective to do this. But at the same time, the goal is to break the morale of your opponent and bombing their capital is a good way to do it. We also see German Zeppelins bombing London in order to try to break British morale. Again, not effective at, you know, ending the war, but effective in hurting the morale of the British. 
Here's a German Zeppelin pilot describe, describing this new philosophy of total war, which you definitely need to pause and take in. So here's total war. Neither side had the ability to carry this to its logical conclusion during World War I, but keep this whole idea in mind because during World War II, we are going to have the ability to do this and it's going to be incredibly, incredibly unpleasant. Both, one of the things that caused World War I was the massive buildup of battleships. There was only really one big battleship battle in uh, World War I, and it's the Battle of Jutland. It was the attempt by the German high seas fleet to break through the British blockade. And again, you can go and find the video and watch it in more detail if you're interested. It's, it's pretty fascinating. But the general takeaway is they were countered by the British. Both sides lost a series of ships. The Germans went back to their base, the British went back to their base, and in the end, there was not a decisive sort of victory in the Battle of Jutland, and there would not be another battleship battle because neither side wanted to risk their fleet. Finally, we get the Nivelle Offensive. With this war of attrition dragging on and on, the French change commanders to a guy named Nivelle. He's going to order a massive French offensive, but the French soldiers, rather than fighting, start mutinying, and so they refuse to fight. We see, huge, we see huge casualties for the ones that do fight, but we also have 23,000 soldiers court-martialed. The French fire Nivelle, bring in a new general who's now just going to try to hold the lines and hold stuff together. And it's understood that if another offensive by the French is ordered, it might lead to the collapse of the French government. And so both sides are beginning to be strained to the breaking point. Germany is really struggling to get men and food. The French can't launch offensives. The British are, the war is becoming increasingly unpopular. And so there's a real question of how much longer this great war can go on. So we'll leave us there. Next time, we'll talk about the war in other parts of the world and how World War I, the extent to which World War I was really a world war. So we'll leave Europe there for now. Thank you for listening.